so first of all, uh, I'm speaking with director Anthony. Is it D. Ambrosio? I want to make sure I get that pronounced right. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much for taking your time to be here today, Anthony. And for the little mix up, um, I apologize for any type of uh, glitches we've had to start off with here. So no, no, no problem. No worries. First, I, I have to tell you, I was, um, I was just on the good old social media, like I am a lot. And all of a sudden I see this project and it just immediately caught my eye with, with personal affinity, obviously to, to, to this subject matter. And I don't want to give it away because I want you to be able to talk about it in your own words. And I just dove not only deeper into it, Anthony, but then I, I dove kind of deeper into your story as well. And can you kind of talk just at a high level before we get into um, your your project with Triumph of the Heart and and just where that journey has taken you to now? I don't want to give away anything. I want you to kind of have it bare canvas here and we can take it where it goes. So For sure, for sure. So high level, who I am. Um, my name is, you know, Anthony D'Ambrosio. I grew up in a very Catholic family and uh, professional dad, Catholic. He's like a, on the speaker circuit and all that. But um, yeah, I have spent the last six years um, growing uh, an agency that works on uh, telling stories that uh, compel and uh, create movements. Um, mostly working inside of uh, the church um, and then also working on something called Catholic Creatives, which was um, a, a movement of Catholic artists that wanted to see a new renaissance uh, take place in the church. Um, during that time, I've spent a lot of time writing and, um, and had always uh, hoped in some way to get a chance at uh, making, making a movie. And I, I just always felt like from like this sense deep down that um, that a lot of these saints that I had read about and loved growing up, like the, that um, the films about them, the stories that, that were told about them just were not getting the core of who they really were and why they were so popular. I think we just have this like strange, I don't know, collective, I don't know, amnesia or mythologizing that happens with saints that, makes us actually obfuscate like, the things that were actually really unique and special about them um, because of our own perhaps lack of understanding of uh, holiness um, and naive ideas about about what is holy uh, makes us like focus on parts of people's stories that really don't matter. So anyway, um, I got the chance to write a, a short film about St. Maximilian Kolbe's passion and uh, promote that in the Diocese of Dallas for a, an event that was specifically made to reach um, un, unchurched and dechurched people and uh, millennials in particular. And um, yeah, it was a really amazing experience and getting to see what God could do with that short film. Um, it, it just was obvious to, I think, all of us that there needed to be something bigger done. And um, yeah, I, I got to finish the, the feature length script living in um, in Poland for a little bit with the, the friars there interviewing them and um, and getting to be I guess as close to Colby as I could um, and then uh, raised the money uh, very quickly uh, and went out and shot and uh, just got back from that in November so if I remember seeing that was that in 2018 that short film that you did that's right. Yeah. And so that kind of branched into this, uh, what, what I've, what I've read and what I've seen is true active. Well, I, I kind of first want to go back what you said about connecting like movies, connecting with saints specifically mm -hmm. as a human in this day and age, for me, it really is hard to just, it's not only hard for me to just connect with someone that might be alive today but let alone the, these remarkable stories of some of these people and to connect with them. It's hard for me to make that connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that it's especially hard too for people that we, um, that we admire. Um, and I think as Catholics, we really want to guard like our heroes and um, we want their stories to be, uh, to really show their sanctity. 
uh, which is a is really admirable and something that I think is really important. Um, but a lot of times that means that we dehumanize them in the way that we tell stories about them. You know, like um, you can even <laughs> like when I was reading through testimonies about Colby um, that were eyewitness testimonies, you know, people that knew him, they, uh, that were like, you know, for the canonization of all of this documentation that was, um, that was created as a part of that process. And, uh, there's a lot of people who knew him as a kid that were just like, he was the most perfect kid, always loved Jesus, like he just kind of came out a saint and that's really like how he was, he was special. And they want to, I think that, that instinct, like we want to communicate their specialness. And so we like go to the beginning of their story and just say, you know, this person came out a saint, they were levitating at six years old. Um, that's like a proof of their sanctity. And uh, if you actually talk to the Franciscans who were living in community with him, it was like not, it was like not the case. That was not how they talked about him. And they love him, you know, they love him. But he was a brother, a real human being with, uh, lessons to learn about life. And uh, I think that it's that humanity in the saints that makes them connect with us. If we feel like they're not human, uh, we don't feel like we can achieve what they achieve. I think that's a big uh, mistake for us as we talk about uh, the saints. Before we get into the film, can you talk a little bit about when you're saying Colby and who this person is, can you talk a little bit about that story? Um, and j just from... I want to hear kind of from you because I know there's also a angle you took on telling the story in the film that's even a little different as well. Yeah, I, I guess I'll talk first about the um, like just general overview of Colby and then kind of how I found my way into into uh, I guess making <laughs> making a movie about it. But um, when so in Poland, uh, during the World War II era, um, Kolbe had created uh, the largest priory in, uh, in Europe. And he had about 600 to 700 friars, young friars who were all highly fervent and committed to renewal of their order and to, uh, to this mission of sharing the heart of the Immaculata with the world. And uh, that was through something called the Militia Maculata, which was a magazine and newspaper and ultimately like a whole media conglomerate. You could imagine that it's it's like pre-EWTN, like the first real Catholic kind of media giant um, that had been made. This this was Colby that did that. Um, he's kind of like a Bishop Barron, if you will. Celebrity in Colin for sure. Um, knows the president, is regularly in touch with uh, high officials, generals, etc., in the Polish um, in the Polish nation, and uh, as the Nazis kind of rolled into town, um, he was brought into uh, Auschwitz because of uh, anti-fascist writing that he had done. Um, at the time, they were trying to the, the Nazis were really trying to break the spirit of Colin. Um, this was before the uh, the concentration camps were really being used for, at least in Poland, really being used for the Holocaust. Um, their main point was to break the intelligentsia and the, um, I guess, the aristocratic kind of uh, sect of, of Polish culture. And in doing so, to try and break the spirit of the Polish people to, to, to enslave them, ultimately, that was their goal. Um, and so Colby, uh, seeing this attack that was happening on the um, the identity and the very humanity of his brother Poles um, during a moment when uh, they were punishing the people for uh, a breakout. Uh, they used like a collective punishment where if somebody broke out or went missing, they would take 10 people from that person's uh, prisoner block and condemn them to starvation, uh, death by starvation and exposure. They would put, put them in a, in a dark cell block with no food and water and just leave them there until they died. Um, and uh, Colby traded his life for one of the other men in that lineup and joined the other nine men in that cell. Um, and so his story, I think, really resonates with a lot of people for his really heroic kind of self-sacrifice. Um, but that's really only like a two inches deep 
view of what it meant to um, to the Polish people, to the people in Auschwitz that he did that, and um, particularly to the other nine men who were in the cell. Um, and so uh, my perspective in the film is really telling the story of these other people who were uh, who were imprisoned with him and who died with him. Uh, and his love, his accompaniment, his ultimate, um, I guess, the spiritual fatherhood for those men while they were grieving. So uh, my own story with that, and I'm, I've been talking for a while, so if you need to interrupt me and redirect me, feel free to do that. But um, I actually have a rather kind of unique way into this story. I was not a fan of Colby. I actually, <laughs> I really did not like him. Um, when I was in, I went to seminary, and it was a rather, um, yeah, I was all the way in out of culture. So obviously Colby's name comes up all the time. Um, and uh, you have all of these pictures of him that he just looks like this very stern kind of frowny face and uh, very like militant kind of, uh, until you know the polls, you don't, you, you have to understand this is Polish Catholicism. It's just this like muscular kind of thing, very like, you know, flat emotions, but like incredibly warm on the inside. Um, but I think that um, I, I had a little bit of a bias against him for a long time. And um, my own journey, whenever I was in, in um, leaving seminary, I fell very much in love with somebody. And um, I won't go into like all of the details unless you ask me more questions. But um, all that to say, I, I had a really profound moment, um, one of the most profound moments of my relationship with God in prayer and adoration where I received a healing, a miraculous healing and a kind of a promise um, or a, a word that I would marry this person. And um, we ended up years later actually dating and it looked like that was going to be coming true. And then I had a, um, a physical and uh, illness and infection that nobody could really figure out. Um, that caused all of these mental issues, uh, sleep issues, made it very difficult for me to, to talk and communicate. And um, ultimately, uh, I had to leave the relationship um, because I knew that I couldn't move forward into um, engagement and marriage while I was uh, going through what I was going through. And it didn't feel fair to, to me to sort of make her wait. Um, and she ultimately married somebody else before I had kind of gotten better. And um, there was an intense grief that I experienced in that, an intense doubt um, in my relationship with God as I, you know, reflected on that uh, moment of, of prayer. Uh, I, I felt like I couldn't really, um, I couldn't really make sense of what, what I had experienced and how, uh, yeah, if that was not from God, then all of these other moments that I had potentially misinterpreted in my relationships with God before, like everything kind of began to fall apart. Um, I experienced what a lot of people call a deconstruction. And during that time of, of atheism and um, anger and grief, um, I was confined to my room quite a bit because I'm sleeping like a couple hours a night. And so um, I'm like laying awake in bed or trying to fall asleep or whatever. Um, very isolating and kind of torturous for anybody who's experienced that. Um, I began to meditate, find myself meditating on the story of Colby, um, not from the perspective of, you know, this man whose life he saved, but from the perspective of these other nine men who were trapped in this cell and who didn't get a happy ending, who didn't get to have the rescue. Um, they were alive for 14 days, which is miraculous. Um, if you know what they were, what it was like to, to be in that situation, for them to survive for that long, they had to fight for it. Um, they were uh, found singing, praying Polish prayers. Uh, they became sort of the spiritual backbone for the people outside in Auschwitz. You could hear these songs um, and the people in the prison cells beside them who began to sing with them over this kind of vigil that, that was created. And so um, 
when people talk about what it was like to witness this, it was like people describe it as an explosion of light that happened in the darkest place in the world and that reminded them of who they were and helped them reclaim their humanity. And so it was very much like that for me as I was in these meditative conversations with Colby in my cell. It really felt like he entered into that with me and helped me to find hope and faith again. Thank you for sharing all of that. Tying that into, I heard you talk about kind of this inspiration of telling the story. And I've known about um, St. Maximilian Colby, Colby's story, um, my confirmation saint and all that. But this is the first time I've ever heard someone say, this is a story told from seemingly, you know, only having, I was, I was able to read this script, which was awesome and seeing all the behind the scenes, but seemingly from those other nine men, like you never hear about that. Yeah. I think it's because that's the most uncomfortable part of the story. You know, it's, it's really easy to praise God for the work of salvation that he did for the life of this man who Colby saved, right? But um, that wasn't the majority of the people in Auschwitz, right? Like that was one person. So what was God doing? Where was he in this incredibly tragic, demoralizing, and dehumanizing situation for all of these other people? Um, I think we really like to be able to dwell on that, like, oh, and the happy ending, you know, like this guy got to have a life and get to go back to that. And um, it feels really, you know, like God came through, but that's just not how God usually works for most people. And so I think it takes a different level of courage to find, uh, find this story and begin to find your way into it devotion to the saint um, and to Maximilian Colby from the perspective of these men who, who um, didn't get saved. Were you scared to make this movie? Oh my did God. Did you have any, God, God, yeah. you have any fear <laughs> about what you were getting into with this whole thing? Um, um, yeah. I mean, it, it honestly makes me want to cry. Like, it, when I first was in Auschwitz and um, was you know, looking at the cell, it, it was, it was so horrifying to me that I was just like, Oh my God, I don't think that I have it in me to create an environment like this, that we have to live in as a set and crew and actors for, you know, a month and a half. Like it's, it takes real courage to walk into this kind of place. It's, it's, I would say it's similar to like if you've ever, you know, been with someone in hospice who's passing and especially if it's somebody who's uh, passing before their time, it's such an ugly thing. Even though it can be so beautiful, the discomfort that you can have before you walk in, you know, like this is the best thing. I'm, I don't want to miss this moment, but there's like a, a fear of facing the reality of death and of suffering that I think makes us really want to avoid it. And so for me, yeah, I, I felt that very particularly and strongly. And every single person who worked on the process and on the movie, I think had to come to terms with that in some way themselves. Did you ever feel like there might be backlash in telling this story because it's so it, it, yeah, yeah. It, it can be oh, yeah. so controversial and so different angles. Like, yeah, I mean, you're you, by doing anything public like this, you are going to enter into controversy. And um, I'm saying that like I'm fine with it now because the blowback hasn't really happened, and you know, I'm sure that I'll be crying in bed at some point, looking at the reviews and like feeling like people were unfair, but. I, I would say that I've already experienced that in Poland. Um, there's a, 
I won't go into all of that, but there's Colby is a very controversial figure in in Poland, and um, there's a, a way that I think we want to really guard like our saints from um, from a storyteller who would warp the the story and and to to show a part of him that feels like does a disservice and. I think that's really a noble, it's like a noble desire to be defensive and, and like the justification that we have for that is like immense. I mean, the hit pieces that people have been doing on um, to try and discredit any scene, they're just, they're everywhere. So I understand it. But at the same time, um, I think to show uh, a saint's humanity, um, to show a flaw is is going to really shake some people up. They're going to be like, I, I would never have seen him there's some scenes um, that we have in the film that I know people are going to get upset at. Um, and I don't know how many, uh, but it's going to happen um, because he's not perfect all the way through. And he, he shows a, a part of his like, you know, raw humanity at different moments in the script that make him ultimately very relatable to these other men in the cell and that ultimately help to uh, facilitate their conversion. But I think that if you're, um, yeah, if you want something that's very glossy and that just kind of catechizes people, um, that this movie is probably going to be upsetting in, in multiple levels, you know. Uh, but I think in a way that will be spiritually ennobling um, for for anybody that's got the courage to kind of sit down and sit through it. And to that point. And not even this is the first time I've ever met you face to face, but I just want to say um, how I admire the courage to to tell it in a real way. To your point, this was a human being. Like, and how many times do we hear these remarkable people, no matter who they are? But you hear them in this light of like, it is impossible for me because I know like I'm messing up like every day on things. Like it's impossible for me to connect with this seemingly perfect person. But yeah, then it's like, yeah. wait a minute, I can I can be I can be a human being, but I could also maybe do some extraordinary things too in my way. Right, right. Right, like that right. gives me hope here in that. Yeah, and I think that you have to be able to see somebody fail a little bit before they win. Um, I mean, that's really the heart of drama, too. You can't, you can't enjoy a story where the character doesn't struggle. It's like part of the like, baseline rule of theater. <laughs> you have a character that has something they want, and they have a million obstacles between them and getting that thing, and they have to grow and learn things about the world themselves in order to ultimately like achieve that desire and goal. That's what a story is. And in its structure, it's basically encapsulating in like this kind of DNA, um, a moral, a spiritual truth about the world and about humanity that um, it's trying to pass down in a sticky way to the next generation. And so I think um, we have to be able to show that struggle in order to be able to pass down the, the sticky truth of what holiness actually is. What do you hope people will get out of this that may not be Catholic, that may not yeah. be a certain religion, yeah. that may be whatever, maybe they're agnostic? Like, it's a kind of a two-part question. What do you want them to get out of it? And what do you want overall people to get out of it, knowing that it stemmed from this personal, personal inspiration from your own struggles, yeah. what do you want people to get out of this? I mean, I want people to get out of it what I experienced when I was meditating as a non-Catholic, you know. Um, I want people to get hope. I think that it's, it's um, I'm just speaking from personal experience here, but um, I think that when when we come of age in the world that we live in right now, it's, it's incredibly disillusioning and um, incredibly uh, there's a jadedness and a cynicism that uh, I think our generation has. And um, certainly that we're seeing in the next generation coming up. And I think it's because the lack of trust in institutions, the, um, the incredible like confusion about, 
who we are and about um, the world as it is. There's just not a lot of of foundations and voices that we can trust that are authority that are pointing us towards hope. And um, this is, I think, a a time where we need stories of human beings that point towards something transcendent that's beyond um, what makes sense according to the normal rules of this world. Um, to call what uh, Colby experienced and the other nine men in that cell experienced a triumph is it's an argument for <laughs> a different standard of success than what the world offers. Um, and I, for one, will say that I think that what the, the world offers in terms of success, hedonism um, and perfection, you know, chasing and, and career, it's, it's empty, it's unfulfilling, it's crushing, it's anxiety inducing. And in the, the statistics for the suicide rate globally went up 30% in one year last year. Like, we're in a crisis of meaning and a crisis of hope. And you don't have to be Catholic or Christian to find a life of a man who accompanied nine other men in their death and um, helped them to find hope in the midst of that. Like, you don't have to be Catholic to understand that story and, and admire it and get something out of it. It's so awesome. Um, and I was just, it was. It, I was just talking to somebody today about um, about someone who knew someone who had taken their life and this last week and it was because they had lost hope and there were it was a young man and it's just it's so heartbreaking right and there's to your point there's these tons of stories in the world of of not having that. And when you said that, I, I read on your LinkedIn and, and I wanted to I wanted to read this. I thought this was so cool. You said this was I'm assuming this was after you got back from Poland and filmed. But you said after my return to the States, I find myself comparing myself to other successes yet again. Homes, cars, vacations, clothes. But now the trap feels hollow. And then I want to go to that last line that you said there. You said. I wanted to jump across the room, close the distance, and I wanted nothing of the kind of success that would allow me to have such a big space with so few people to fill it with. And it was like, I mean, how how true. It's, it's, it's the Orson Welles mansion that he ends up in this huge mansion, but he's alone. And it's, I mean, you could take that so many ways, but I can only imagine... I can only compare it to, um, I had visited Auschwitz. I've seen the cell, Block 11. The execution wall is right outside that right, cell wall. Right. And, and to walk that and just think what what these men and, and people are experiencing in that. Like, and in you, you spent so much time here with this crew, came back. And I cannot imagine that just does not change you in some way going through what you and your crew just went through yeah i mean how does this like terrible terrible cell become like a chapel or a cathedral i mean this is eyewitness testimonies of the uh of the person the translator kind of janitor person who was there who was an eyewitness to all of this um that is how he described it how does that happen? Um, how does it become sort of like this, this central place of hope that's emanating light? Um, it's that um, the story of the gospel is Jesus coming down into suffering and transforming death into a place of hope. Um, that's, that's what the gospel is. And in the cell, like these men became brothers and they got to taste a, a bit of heaven together um, before they went there. And I think that um, one of the things that we've taken back, that I certainly have taken back from the experience, is just this 
um, appreciation for like the closeness of deprivation that's shared, um, that's that's chosen together, that's embraced together. Um, I think that um, C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce has this amazing picture of hell that's like a suburb that's always expanding, um, which I think is hilarious because that's what suburbs always ultimately do. You know? <laughs> they just keep on duplicating themselves over and over and over again. And the people in these, um, the goal of, of wealth is for people to be able to move further and further away from each other because they're so bothered. They want so much ownership over their life and their existence. And um, I think in this strange kind of inverted way, uh, how like the kingdom of heaven works, that um, the revoking of, of material comfort for the sake of closeness and connection um, is far more fulfilling. It's far more fulfilling. And um, ultimately is, uh, I think for these men, like tragic, right? Like there's no, there's nothing that makes sense of that kind of death and that kind of suffering. But despite that, the compassion that they find from Colby and that ultimately they show to each other is, um, is an overcoming of that, a victory, a triumph over um, the suffering of the material world that I think is just absolutely gorgeous. And it's a testament to the fact that um, the thing that we want the most in life is love. And in so many ways, we're the ones that are so in between us and that. Like in our goals, they're just... It's so funny. It's just hilarious. It's like we've been convinced to go after this fool's gold, you know, that uh, cars and the job and the success and all of that uh, just allow us to have bigger and bigger houses. And it's so, but but it's so easy to get caught up in that. Right. And yet what you're talking about so much is this thing that I think we all do yearn for is this relationship with each other. But it's like, it's so damn scary anymore to like even say hi. Like if I, if you saw me on the street and you see this big nose guy walking down with a smile, you'd be like, who is this crazy guy? Like, uh, okay. Like we, but, but to be able to be like, okay, wait, we're two human beings here. We're going through this. And that's a shared experience that only you two will experience in whatever way. But these other 10 men in this cell to your point, only they know what they experienced and to, and to share and, and to, to tell a story around that. It's just, it's truly, um, it is beautiful. It is beautiful. And I, I'm so excited for this, for this to release. Thank you. I appreciate that, man. I, I am really excited for it to come out as well. And I really hope that it can inspire people to, I guess, have a little bit of that, I guess, inverted measuring system <laughs> that um, that I think Colby had that God has given um, to us in, in the kingdom through our baptism, which is like to be able to see love as the main thing and that everything else, everything else is like completely, um, is just fool's gold compared to that. Uh, and that we have the ability to fill our lives with that love really regardless of where we are and what our circumstances are. So that's what the story is really about. Do you feel like going through this experience, Anthony, that do you feel like something's supported you along the way through this whole thing? Have you felt something beyond oh my gosh man yeah i um i think colby really like came to me i think that he picked me because uh, saints tend to do this in some weird way um i wasn't looking for him you know <laughs> um 
and I think that he has been a partner in this in a way that's really hard to describe to people that would probably make me sound very, um, I don't know, over-spiritualizing and, and woo-woo or something. But um, I, when, my, when I was first there in Poland, um, I was going through another bout of this, like, um, this infection and it was a really difficult, very difficult time for me. Um, and <laughs> when I reverenced, I got to reverence, um, Colby's cell and his, um, uh, a first class relic of him on his feast day. Uh, basically all of these people from all around Auschwitz, uh, in these towns, they all pilgrimage together. They process together singing Polish hymns and songs to Auschwitz on his feast day. And then they have this beautiful mass in front of the cell um, where they sing hymns, traditional hymns that likely would have been sung inside of the cell. Um, the most profound like kind of contrast of light and darkness in a mass that I've seen in my life. And when I came back at the end of mass, you go out, uh, like going to the Eucharist, you go out and go into a cell, reverence it, and then come back and reverence the, um, the, uh, the first class relic. And when I, I kissed the relic, I physically felt somebody kissing me back on the lips, like a man. And I, I it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> like, I was like really, really uncomfortable. With it. <laughs> um, but there was this sense like, that, that Colby was like saying to me, you know, like, um, I'm choosing you to do this. I'm choosing you. Uh, this is like my kiss to bless you and to let you know that I'm like with you in, in the making of this. Um, the same way that I was like um, with you in, in your insomnia and in the cell um, of your bedroom. And it's going to be the same way through the process of, of making this film. And um, that's completely been the case. Like, uh, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life and I've gotten more bailouts than like anybody should get when they're making, like, making a film like this. I've taken some of the most ridiculous risks that like, uh, I've ever taken in my life. And, uh, just the truth is I think Colby did that in his life and he really loves that attitude. And I don't know, maybe that's something of why he felt like I would be the one to tell it, but, um, I was extended so far beyond my means that I was like completely dependent on supernatural aid to come in and, and fix, <laughs> fix so many of the messes that I made. Sounds like such a, a familiar story with people that not a familiar in the detailed sense that you talked about a familiar story. When, when you hear of these remarkable people that take a step of pure faith, like, which leads into another thing I wanted to make sure we touched on is you have a Kickstarter campaign going on right now. Like this isn't something that you've saved up your savings account. I've got the money now. Come on, people, let's get in a plane and go to Poland. Talk about inversing it. It's yeah. what I'm hearing yeah. is a walk of faith and somehow it's going to get done yeah whether yeah. it's through my own personal physical ailments whether it's through not having the finances you just started kicking off the campaigning for this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah we like i think um even from the beginning we kept on trying to find a way to give ourselves more time by being like oh well if we get the money raised by the end of April, then we'll shoot this year. But we know that's like impossible. So uh, we'll just say that to everybody and then um, and kind of secretly hope that, that we miss this deadline because like making a movie in uh, within like six months in a foreign country is very inadvisable. Let's just say that. And, like, and then being like, okay, well, uh, we're going to try and release the film like you know, in August and we don't have any money for post because we spent it all like on all the crises that happened already. So 
Um, yeah, we're we're raising money right now for post production, um, and part of what this campaign is about, it's not just about getting money. I think that God can give it to us in a lot of different ways. It would have been, frankly, probably a lot easier and less stressful. Um, I had people who offered, like, I could have just taken a $60,000, $80,000 investment, and um, it would have been a lot less work than, than building a crowdfunding campaign. But um, the crowdfunding campaign has this role in the making of the film where we're bringing the project to the world. And if the world says yes, then distributors take note that they see that people have come behind it and have put their resources, their money where their mouths are, that they really are tired of seeing like crappy saint movies or movies that don't portray um, Catholicism honestly. Um, if they're tired of that and they want to see a renaissance of, of Catholic art, um, this is a way for them to actually make a difference uh, because when you put money down, that is seen by lots of eyes who did not believe that this movie was possible and who were not willing to take it seriously until now. Do you, after going through this experience, did I hear right that, you know, your long-term goal is to continue telling these stories of these remarkable saints, people, and, and, and continuing on this, um, just, a, just amazing walk of faith. Yeah. It's not just me. You know, I, I think I want to make something like a Disney studios that's doing, uh, films and, and games and movies and all the, that type of stuff that, that helps people to, understand like family values you know that was like originally what disney was about um and of course he got it wrong in, in different ways but like there was a there was an intention there and an effect that he had uh with what he did that was powerful and I, so i would like to see something like that happen but regardless of whether it's me at the helm or not i think if this movie succeeds it will break ground and pave the way for other catholic filmmakers to say they did it i could maybe i could try that and other catholic investors who say wow like they actually stewarded this money really well and it wasn't just like a um a black hole you know like it it was fruitful and i think if if we do that um it's going to really be like shock waves kind of through the the catholic um, artists and creative community that's going to just open up vision for what what more can be done for many more than just me. I think I'm going to leave it there. I don't want to force anything. And this was just <laughs> cool. Cool.